All right, we're getting organised. Uh, got a big show coming up tonight. Taking a bit of effort to get this one off the ground. G'day, John. How you going, Susan? Welcome, Bill. Evening, Joan. Brett. Christine. Paul, Gary, Derek. Howdy Adam, we're uh, getting organised there, only a minute or so and we should be right to go again. G'day Glenn, Peter, Chris. Hi Rob. Welcome Philip, Adam. I think we're getting uh, close to start time now, guys. Like I said, a massive show coming up. Uh, a massive show coming up tonight. Going to keep us uh, very, very busy and on our toes. And we will be just getting close to us kicking off now. Just about. Give it a little bit more time yet. I think. Not quite. Okay. I think we've probably got to be just about close to uh, start time now, guys. Just uh, one minute to go, and uh, they'll give me a cue, and we can get on there. G'day, Troy. How are you going? G'day, Jim. Howdy, Fred. Frank, how are you doing? Welcome to the Mind Lab Show, Australia's most informative prospecting live stream. This is the place where you'll get all the tips, tricks and super deals you need for your next gold prospecting or treasure hunting adventure. Included in tonight's episode, I've got some breaking news on pay dirt. I've got a fantastic top tip. As per usual, we're going to give away some great kit to a viewer on Facebook and YouTube. And I have a special interview with Mine Lab's Chief Engineer, Mark Laurie, and much, much more. I'm Gold Digger Dave. Let's get digging. There's nothing like the sound of gold under the coil when I'm out there swinging my detector. There's nothing like the sound of gold under the coil when I'm out there swinging my detector. Okay, well, look, let's kick off as per usual with the gold price. And the gold price, well, since last week's update, the gold price has risen slightly to around $2,560 Australian per troy ounce. It did dip a little in the first uh, few days of February before bouncing back to the current price last time I had a quick look. So compared to this time in 2021, the gold price has seen a rise of around about $200 an ounce over Australian over the past year, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at. We'll continue to keep a close eye on the gold price and keep you posted on the Mind Lab show. Now, look, uh, we've got a few events starting to happen now. I've been mentioning these for a week or two. So what we're looking at here, we've got the Bendigo Gem Show Expo, which is coming up. So if you haven't got this already in your diary, uh, don't forget, it's definitely on on the 19th and 20th of February, so it's Saturday the 19th, Sunday the 20th of February, uh, the Pendigo Gem, Gem Club, it's their annual expo, uh, holding uh, on these dates, and it's held at the Bendigo Baptist Church, which is on McIver Road in Juniton. There'll be a mini detecting area, there'll be a sieving area for people to sieve some gems and some coloured rocks, plenty of stalls and displays, demonstrations, 
a barbecue and refreshments. Just follow the link in the feed there uh, if you want to get a little bit more information on that one. And of course, also coming up, we have the Fosterville Gold Australian Gold Panning Championships. And as I mentioned uh, last week, the panning championships are also going to be held on that weekend. So it's uh, February the 19th, Saturday, February the 19th, the Blackwood Sport and Recreation Reserve, which is just 20 kilometres north of Balan. Uh, run by the Victorian Gold Panning, run by the Victorian Gold Panning Association, the affiliation with the world, uh, in association with the World Gold Panning Association. So there's a lot of associations in there. There's a range of categories uh, for people of all ages and experience levels, including the Eureka Challenge, where competitors pan for gold using their supplied traditional steel pans and finals are held for each of the major categories made up of the panners who have recorded the fastest times and the most accurate well, pieces of gold going back out, I guess, uh, in each heat. Trophies will be awarded for all the winners, so stay tuned because we'll be talking to Marcus Binks from the Victorian Gold Panning Association, he's the president there, uh, about what's coming up in the championships a little later in the show. Now, Miners Den are, of course, sponsors uh, for both of these events, so look out for more details. We're putting some stuff up on our Facebook pages and newsletters and things like that to keep you informed what's happening there. The training days, still putting the icing on the cake for those ones. Just got a couple more things to go, so it shouldn't be too long until those dates will be out. Of course, they're free if you purchased an SDC or a GPX or GPZ machine from Miners Den. Um, and you'll be able to get some more information in store or online as soon as I get those up there. Uh, now, look for our weekly viewer giveaway this week. Uh, I've had to raid the prize cupboard a little bit. This week I've got a great viewer giveaway. Um, as always, I've got one for YouTube and one for Facebook. I've put together a range of bits and pieces and like knocked together a little panning kit, basically, uh, that includes the Mine Lab Pro Gold 15-inch pan, the Miners Den Pro Gold 10-inch pan, the Mine Lab Classifier, which is uh, available as well, a sniffer bottle, a couple of small vials, a Mine Lab cap, and I've thrown in a, Harry Ca a handy carry bag for you to put all that stuff in. So one for Facebook, one for YouTube. Just make sure you're in the feed and keep watching to see if you're one of the lucky winners. Good luck and happy prospecting. Look, we've got another episode of Gals on the Goldfields, and this week Rhonda tells us about the story of storekeeper extraordinaire Martha Clending. Um, let's have a look and see what Rhonda was able to dig up on this episode. Hi, it's Rhonda, back with another great episode of Gals on the Goldfields. This episode of Gals on the Goldfields is about those who supplied the miners with the things they needed whilst they were out in the diggings, the storekeepers. One such storekeeper was Martha Clendinning, who had a store on the Ballarat Goldfield. Martha was born in Ireland, but came to Australia from England in 1852 with her husband George. George was a doctor. George left Martha in Melbourne with her sister, whilst he went to Ballarat with her brother-in-law to look for gold. Martha and her sister decided they would follow their husbands and walk the 95 miles to Ballarat. They had a plan to set up a store but their husbands were dead set against it. Respectable women did not operate a business, but they did. They hired a bullock dray, filled it with many things, bedsteads, mattresses, blankets, chairs, cooking utensils, and lots of provisions to sell to the miners. After the long walk to Ballarat, they set up a big store in the front of their tent, selling tea, coffee, sugar, candles, tobacco, jam, bottle fruit, cheese, dress materials, and baby clothes. Martha and her sister were really proud of their store and even more proud of the fact that they were one of the very few stores that did not sell Sly Grog. A very respectable establishment it was. It was pretty expensive to run a store back then because a storekeeper's license cost 40 pounds per year. Martha's sister returned to Melbourne, but Martha continued to run the store on her own until 1855 often living for long periods of time alone in their tent. By 1855, Martha closed her store. 
for a few reasons. The larger businesses were too much competition for her and the storekeeper's license was getting way too expensive. But it was really because her husband had found enough gold to support the family. And as Ballarat grew, social attitudes towards middle class women were changing too. Ballarat was becoming more conservative, a settled community with middle class women who were not supposed to be businesswomen. Their place was in the home, being wives and mothers, of course. Martha was a member of St Paul's Church of England and played a big part in its community. She was the treasurer of the Ladies Benevolent Clothing Society too. Martha was also one of the 26 women who helped establish the Ballarat Female Refuge in 1867, an institution to support single mothers on the goldfields. So I guess you could say that Martha not only fed the population, she prayed for them, she made sure they had warm clothes, and gave them a safe place to live. What a great gal to have on the goldfield. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Gals on the Goldfields. See you next time. Okay, so that was uh, Gals on the Goldfield for this week. Another great story there from Rhonda. Now, look, next we're going to take a look at the legend of Lassiter's Reef. Now, the legend of Lassiter's Reef has been around for almost a century. Gold prospector Harold Lassiter claimed that in the early 1900s there was a large gold-bearing quartz reef somewhere west of the McDonald's Ranges in Central Australia. Many of the gold hunters searched in vain for the famous reef and recently explorer and treasure hunter Bill DeCarley believes he has found the famous quartz reef to the east of the ranges near the Northern Territory Queensland border. Vietnam veteran Bill uh, has been searching for Lassiter's Reef for about 30 years. In 1991, Bill set out with his nephew following the Tropic of Capricorn to the east of Alice Springs. What they found was a giant milky quartz reef uh, outcrop. According to Bill, from there they were, could clearly see what Lasser had described as three hills he referred to as the Three Sisters. Since that first trip, Bill has made nine other trips into the outback, locating landmarks Lassiter had written about in his diary. According to Bill, surface samples taken from the reef have so far proven to be gold positive. Only time will tell if Bill's fortune will be made and the mystery of Lassiter's reef can finally be laid to rest. Now next up we've got Nathan coming to fill us in on the Miner's Den Service Centre in his tech tip and this time he's having a look at the battery seal on the CTX 3030 or the GPZ 7000. Let's have a look how we change one of those now. Hi I'm Nathan from Miner's Den Mine Lab Service Centre and today I'm going to show you how to replace a seal on a CTX 3030 and a GPZ 7000. So it's going to be the battery seal so through time, over time this can wear out or can get lots of dirt and foreign objects on it. So I'll show you how to replace it or at least check it and clean it if necessary. So firstly you'll have to take the battery off. It's behind the battery. And now this one is a red seal you can see on the, on the side here. So what you'll have to do is get a very small screwdriver and just try and pop it up without damaging it if you can. Like so. And pull it out like so. So as I can see here, this one's not damaged at all. So I'll just give it a bit of a clean, just with a bit of a rag, we'll be fine. And so that's fine. So yeah, that's right to go back in. But yeah, over time they can wear out and then dirt and foreign objects or water in case of the CDX 3030 can go into the battery and short circuit the battery. Now, if you, the seal is broken, you can buy a seal kit off us at Miner's Den here. You can either buy them online at minersden.com.au or come into our uh, store here in Bendigo or any of those stores and you can buy them off the shop. Alright, now that I've given the seal a, a clean and a, a quick check over, I'm going to put it back into the uh, slot there and put it back in the CDX.
All right, now that's back in. All I've got to do is put the battery back in, like so, and we're done. And now that's how you replace a battery seal on a CTX 3030. It's also the same procedure for a GPZ 7000. So that's been tonight's tech tip on the MindLab show. Well, thanks again for that one, Nathan. A great tip there, and always good to keep your eye on those seals and things. Make sure they're in good working order before you head out again or head into the water uh, with the uh, 3030. Um, I hinted the other week that uh, we're going to let you know about some additions to the Gold Digger Dave Gourmet Pay Dirt range. Well, look. It's almost here, and I'm going to introduce it tonight. It's Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt Bucket. Well, I won't just call it a bucket. It is Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt One Ounce Bucket. It's got a huge 14 plus kilos of gold panning fun. Uh, it's also got one ounce, and that's a troy ounce by the way, which is what gold is weighed in, of gold inside the bucket. It'll be the easiest troy ounce of gold you'll ever get. You're also going to get a large storage uh, uh, vial to put it in, um, and the, the moment we've started out with the one ounce bucket coming with free shipping. So that's right, it's Gold Digger Dave's one ounce bucket. Uh, you can pick one of these up. They're going to be available very shortly for $2,999. So you're going to get your ounce of gold in there, plus a whole pile of fun as well. And you can do it all from the comfort and uh, around your own home. You can do it in a, a wading pool out the back. You can do it in a bathtub if you actually want to. So uh, that's the latest edition. If you head online, you can get a reminder there and it'll let you know the moment it's released. I'm just waiting on a couple of stickers and things to come in. And then these little beauties will be live on the website and ready to purchase. If you wanted to get one in store, either head into Melbourne, Bendigo or Adelaide uh, Miner's Den, Mine Lab, Metal Detector Superstores, and they should have them there in a week or so. So if you're going in the next week or so, just give the guys a call, make sure they've got the buckets and everything there and they're ready to go. It really is the easiest way for you to get an ounce of gold and have a great time honing your panning skills. Some would even say it's probably the cheapest and easiest ounce of gold you'll ever get. And as I keep telling you, and have so for months, Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt from Central Victoria, it is no ordinary gravel. So hopefully you get on, I don't know how many of those will sell, but uh, hopefully we get on and get yourself an ounce of gold there. We've got a little vial to put it in and you're all ready to go. Now you know the best way to keep up with all these things, mine lab, gold prospecting, treasure hunting, is to head to our Facebook page and like us. Or you can even go to the Miners Den Australia YouTube channel and subscribe there or hit us up to get our weekly newsletter delivered straight to your inbox. Miners Den Australia, we really are the Mine Lab experts and uh, we have everything uh, you need to get you out for your next gold prospecting or treasure hunting adventure. So, that's the pay dirt, new addition to the pay dirt. I hope some of you jump onto that as well. As many of you know, late last year I was fortunate enough also to visit Mine Lab HQ in South Australia. We did a bit of a live stream from there for one of the shows. While I was there, I actually got to sit down with Mine Lab Chief Engineer, Mark Laurie. Let's have a look what he can tell us uh, about frequencies and all things Mine Lab. Now I'm here today with Mark Laurie, Mine Lab's Chief Engineer. G'day Dave, how are you going? I'm well, Mark. Yourself? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. You've been around uh, a while with the Mine Lab technologies and things. Yeah, yeah, I've been here nearly 12 years. Okay, right. but so yeah, you, over a decade. You would have seen a lot of uh, change uh, in that time in the development of technologies and things? Yes, yeah, when I joined I was working on the CTX 3030, yep. which was fantastic, like really high-end premium product. And yes. then uh, towards the end of myself doing projects at least, I uh, worked on Equinox yes. 800, which was like, you know, all the innovations of multi-IQ and a faster detector. So yeah, I've seen a lot of change in 10 years. Absolutely. Now, Moldy IQ, I knew had some uh, had a bit to do with that. Mm. Um, Moldy IQ is basically your simultaneous multi-frequency system uh, right. for hunting for coins and relics, and uh, it yep. still has a, a bit to lend to the gold prospecting side as well. A little bit, yeah. But yeah, primarily it's a technology that's transmitting lots of different frequencies 
simultaneously into the ground. Um, that lets us do a couple of things. It primarily lets you, it's a bit like having lots of different size fish hooks and you're fishing while you're going along, you can catch yep. all the different size fishes with one sweep. So with detecting, it means that you don't have to go back over a spot. You know that you've got each frequency, which sees different size targets. Yep. Um, they're all happening at the same time. So one swing and you've got the best chance that you've hit all the different size coins or rings or small nuggets, slightly bigger nuggets, whatever it may be. But primarily for a coin and treasure machine, you're not targeting big nuggets. No, no. You never know, you might walk over the next big one. Absolutely. But, um, so that, that's the first thing is that you're, you're covering lots of different target types as you're walking around. And then the second thing that Multi-IQ really excels at is how it handles the ground, which is sort of yep. part of MindLab's DNA is how well we handle grounds. Uh, all over the world. And so what the multi-IQ lets you do is that the different frequencies, they're all looking at the ground at the same time. Yep. And what they can actually do is you can actually get rid of the thing that's common to all of the frequencies. Okay. And that you're looking at the difference then and that lets us have very solid IDs. Yes. Which lets the user know, oh, that is actually a particular coin and it's down at some depth. Whereas yep. a lot of single frequency machines, they don't have that extra information of all the other frequencies. And so you're you're a number that is the target ID will be jumping all over the place and you're never quite sure whether to dig it or not. So. Yeah, that's right. Well, really, this technology has uh, virtually made uh, the most of the single frequency machines obsolete, really, has it? That was the plan. That was yep. the big push on Equinox to try and uh, bring multi-frequency to the masses, get it down to a price point that everyone could have access to that technology. Yep. and. Um, yeah, it's been very successful. Absolutely, and we see now that uh, uh, you see other people are talking of simultaneous multi-frequency and things like that, but it's not just uh, being able to put the frequencies down, there's a lot of other smarts yeah. that go in there too. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of uh, disciplines in engineering that happen at MindLab. You've got the mechanical team, they're constantly looking at making the lightest weight product, but still strong and robust. Yep. And waterproof, a lot of those things that are uh, in opposition to each other, you can make a very good heavy detector, um, yep. but then people won't want to swing it because they're getting a sore arm. So part of the challenges of designing a product here is b managing all those trade-offs. That's what engineering is, it's uh, yep. advanced trade-off management. Uh, and then you've got the software, um, that's just sort of the magic under the hood that's bringing it all together and the, the computing engine that's taking the, the algorithms, doing all the smart signal yep. processing and making it into a nice, easy to use detector, which is something we focus on a lot in engineering. And it's it's actually quite difficult to make a product that's easy to use. Yeah, I think well, from a customer's point of view, it's it's obvious once they've got it and we're complete, yep. but it'd be a lot easier for us to give you a huge menu system and you could like flounder with all the settings. Yep, and, yep, uh, yep. So yeah, that's, that's one right. of our challenges. I think, I think that's probably one of the things we've seen. Things have, as you've progressed along have mm. got simpler, they've got lighter, yep. uh, and you've been able to increase the performance. Yeah, and it is really tricky, like fitting a technology like multi-frequency, making that cheaper and smaller and lighter and squeezing it all into the box. And yeah, th th that's why we all come to work and have that fun. Now, I've been having a chat with both Peter and Phil, and I've been trying to get a handle <laughs> on what they're actually coming out with next. Would you be able to enlighten me at all on what you could be currently working on? Ah, well, great question, Dave. Um, yeah, we get this one all the time from customers and relatives and yes. whatnot. Um, surprise, surprise, we're working on new metal detectors. Okay, that's, um, that's yep. pretty handy. And we're uh, working across all the market segments. Okay, yes, that's very good. <laughs> and that's about the only bones I can throw you. Um, uh, do you see the potential down the track for MindLab to be able to develop a technology that is a full discriminating detector when hunting for gold? Well, when you can find a metallurgist that can show me the difference between gold and lead, and how it responds, I'd be very keen to talk to that person. Okay, yeah, well, we've, uh, well, we'll see what I can find. All right, um, I'll put it back on you, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, look, there you have it, guys. Uh, I've tried everything I can to find out what's coming out next, but we do know that MindLab are obviously still working on things uh, to help us find more gold, coins and relics. Absolutely. Thanks very much for coming in for the chat, Mark. No worries. Okay, so we're starting to drop in now, and uh, I've got with me, as I mentioned earlier in the uh, show, the Marcus Biggs, who is the president of, of the Victorian Gold Panning Association, and they're running this Australian Gold Panning Championships in conjunction with the uh, Australian Gold Panning and World Gold Panning Champion 
organisations. So there's a lot of organisations and things in there at the moment. So uh, firstly, welcome Marcus. Um, how long have you been involved with these championships? And uh, they sound like a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Dave, for uh, allowing us to talk about the championships and inviting, on, inviting us onto the show. So, yeah, no, I've, I've been, uh, I guess, uh, panning in these comps since about '93, and and uh, been the president of the association for I think it's the last uh, eleven years now. Um, and uh, yeah, it's into our it's basically a twenty seventh. Um, we try and keep it annual, but last year obviously uh, missed it due to COVID. But uh, yeah, we try and keep it as an annual event. Okay, yeah, look, it sounds very good. Uh, if I'm a first-time attendee to your event there, and it's being held at uh, the Blackwood Reserve, about 20 kilometres out of Balan, um, uh, what would I be expecting to see if uh, if I turned up there for the day? Yeah, so what, what we have is uh, there's a number of different categories panners can uh, participate in. So we have categories that cater from uh, the youth, novice, uh, we have uh, veterans, uh, we have uh, skilled competition and we also have teams in amongst that so there's a number of different categories pandas can enter and essentially it's uh ten dollars to enter your for a first attempt in in most of the categories uh youths are five dollars and then any uh repeat attempts we allow um uh, two temp uh, two attempts in each category uh it's five dollars for a second attempt so the way, the way it works is we we have 20 people in a heat and we basically uh, fill a, a bucket of gravel each panda has a bucket of gravel that they're provided and it's got it's been seeded with a, a set number of pieces of gold now they don't know how many pieces are in there but everybody in that heat will have the same amount of gold uh, and so the heats are com uh, made up of mixed categories you might have skilled panners in there you might have some um, juniors or, or, or veterans and the like so they're, they're, they're mixed up but so but uh, essentially what we do is the panners have their own bay and they'll pan off and, and recover a gold to, to, to put in their own bottle. And when they're finished, we've got an electronic timer system. So they uh, signal by um, hitting the stop button and uh, and their time is automatically recorded. Now, they then following that, they'll take their bottle with their pieces of gold in it up to an adjudicator and they'll they'll confirm how many pieces they found. So for instance, if they, they found five pieces uh, and, and there was five put in there, uh, their, their time, so they panned it off in five minutes, their time would stand as five minutes. But uh, for each piece you, you miss, you actually get a three-minute penalty. So okay. uh, if you missed a piece of gold, your five minutes would be adjusted to eight minutes. So uh, that's how yep. we determine um, the, the best panners to go forward into, into the finals. Okay, that sounds great. And there, obviously there's a main event that is the Australian Gold Panning Champion. Um, how does that, that part of work? Yeah, so the, the way we determine the Australian Championship is not one particular category. There's there's two. It's called the, the Eureka Challenge, which is a, a, a an event that everybody uses the traditional tin dish. So everybody in the heat okay. has got exactly the same gold pan. Uh, so that's that's one of the categories. And the other one is the men's skill you've got to participate in. And so what it is is an your aggregate time from the men's skill and the Eureka final, uh, it becomes your, uh, the, that's how we determine the overall winner. Okay, no worries. Now, what time does the day start off? For, do you registrations and things like that? Are there costs and things? Yeah, so the the uh, registration uh, typically opens around 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we typically have to close that by around about 11, just due to the number of pandas, and we typically got all the heats filled, filled by around about 11 o'clock. You can uh, pre-register if you, you're planning to come along and you want to make sure you're guaranteed a, a spot in one of the heats then it's best to send an email to uh, vicgoldpanning at gmail.com.au uh, and uh, you should be able to uh, get pre-registered that way. Uh, and, uh, yeah, essentially, uh, other than that, come on the day and uh, get registered in to see the registration desk to uh, get yourself into, into one of the heats. And I should, should add, we also have a couple of novelty events that we run uh, during the yep. day. Uh, they're called Stake Your Claim. So... The way that works is uh, people uh, can purchase a claim and the 60 claims get uh, sold. And at, at about 12.30, we uh, get line everybody up and, and then uh, and everybody basically say, stake a claim and they head out and uh, and peg their claim in a, in, a, in a plot, basically. And we uh, then draw out a grid. It's got a grid reference on it. And we draw out that grid. And, and if that uh, grid reference happens to land on your 
claim, then you're a winner. And, and there's, uh, uh, we've basically got two events and there's four gold uh, as, uh, uh, in, as part of that event. Okay, that sounds uh, interesting as well. What about food and drinks and things uh, like that? Yeah. Yeah, so we have the, the, the First Bland Scout Group have uh, been uh, catering for our event over the last number of years, so they do a fantastic job and they also provide a, a good number of volunteers to help us uh, to run the day. So they're a great, uh, great support for the, for the comp. And we've also got uh, Mrs D or Sharon uh, from, from uh, Bacchus Marsh. She's got a, a mobile coffee van, so Australians, lo Australians love their coffee and, and uh, I'm guilty of that too. So they'll be there to, to satisfy that craving and, and also the ones that have got a sweet tooth as well. She's uh, got a good okay. uh, mix of sweets there. That's absolutely sounds like you've got most things covered. And um, this is on Saturday, 19th of February, uh, kicking off somewhere around about 8.30 in the morning. And you can go right through until, if you're in the finals, till 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, that's, that, the finals will hopefully kick off around about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and, and, and generally by about 4 o'clock, we do our uh, presentations for the, the, the various category winners. So we've got a great number of prizes there. And, and I can't go past um, thanking the, the, the magnificent support we get from our sponsors. So sponsors and volunteers are the, the two key things you need to, to run a, a competition like this. So um, my lab, um, certainly one of the, uh, the prime uh, sponsors for the event, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, we've got uh, on-site lab services from Bendigo here, uh, gold, gold sponsorship, uh, uh, Lucky Strike down in Geelong, Golden Relics. Uh, they, they, yep. they support uh, year in, year out. They're a great supporter of our event. Uh, we've got Haycap Holdings, a, a, a business supplying activated carbon to the mining industry, uh, Mincor engineering firm, uh, Turbo Pan, uh, the, the, the suppliers of that uh, uh, Kim Hillier's um, uh, centrifugal pan, basically. So, yep. And hopefully they'll be, they'll be there on the day as well. And, and not to forget PM, PMAV and, and Miners Den in, here in Bendigo. Uh, also um, great supporters year in, year out. Oh, well, that sounds uh, like a fantastic day out. And um, there is a Facebook page if people want to have a look at some categories and things they can enter into as well, isn't there? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Victorian Gold Painting Association, or Vic Gold Arse, uh, has, uh, has got a, uh, a page there on the Facebook. So uh, try and find that. And that's certainly got a lot more details there. Uh, and failing that, um, yeah, if you if you um, send an email to the to Vic Gold Painting at gmail dot com, um, uh, that would uh, also be able to get you there. Well, look, uh, thanks for having a, a chat about uh, what's happening on today and everything like that. And we're certainly going to keep some information in the feeds and things and that, so you might hopefully get a few more people uh, turn up and try out some gold panning, hone your skills. I think you've got a little panning area there where you can actually practice as well, can you? Yeah, that's correct. We we do have some practice gravel on uh, standby there, which is it'll have a little bit of gold in the, and and some gemstones for fine. So we we have that free um, for people to come along. And uh, I should say that spectators, it's free entry for spectators, so no cost to, to come along and have a look. And uh, I yep. recommend you to come down. And, you know, even if you don't have the pan, you can certainly get a get appreciation for for, for some of the skill out there in, in the panning game and and some of the different pans that are available as well and how they work and and uh, what. What might be good in competition is not necessarily good in the field, but uh, but nonetheless you can get a get a get some some people are generally there. Most pans are pretty welcoming and and uh, we'll, we'll give you a lesson. And we we've got plenty of gold pans available for those who don't have a pan either. So more than more than willing to to share a pan for you for you to participate in. Excellent. Well, look, that sounds uh, fantastic, and I hope a lot of people can get along and uh, support you down there. Obviously, it takes a bit to put these event on, and. Um, as I said, we'll keep up information in our foods for you and have a great uh, championships. And hopefully we can talk again uh, next year. Maybe we'll do a follow-up after the championships and just uh, get yeah, more information. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm more than happy to, to join in. But, yeah, thanks uh, thanks again, David, for, for your support for the competition and uh, and, and putting us on, on tonight in your live stream. Not a problem in the world. Thanks. Great talking to you, Marcus. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night, everyone. Okay, so now that brings me uh, into my next little segment. So we're going on now to uh, check out the Coffee Bush Kid as he takes us through the safety gear that he takes when he heads out. G'day folks, I'm the Coffee Bush Kid and today we're going to talk safety gear. The basics 
of what potentially you should take out to the bush with you when you go metal detecting. The first thing that you should potentially think about taking out with you when you go out detecting is some sort of first aid kit. Now, Miner's Den, they have the snake bite kit, which is a ripper thing to take with you. A couple of compression bandages, blankets to stop uh, uh, shock setting in, texture to mark where the snake bite area was. And that whole little setup does not take up very much space. The one that I take out with me is in the battery pack on the old Pro Swing 45 harness. And this is what my lovely wife made up for me. I have a compression bandage. I have band-aids in there. And I also have a bottle of antiseptic spray. Uh, this is just the basic. If you get bitten by a snake, there's the compression bandage. If you happen to cut yourself pretty bad, you can put some spray on it, put a band-aid on, you'll get back to the ute all right, and you can seek metal, medical advice if you need to. The next thing that you should probably take out with you is uh, a nice broad-brimmed hat. I'm more of a fan of a broad-brimmed hat than a cap because you've got protection for your tops of your ears, you've got protection for the back of your neck. Now with sun protection too, a long sleeve shirt is a good idea. Yes, they get a little bit warm, but this one is particularly thin, so it's a nice looser weave. You can keep fairly cool with it. Uh, you'll also want to put on some sunscreen as well, because that never ever hurts. And the other thing that you might want is a pair of sunnies. Now, because I wear glasses, these are the fit over type for me. They might not be the best looking thing, but they'll stop the glare on your eyes and uh, it'll protect them a lot more. Another thing that you probably should take is a pair of gloves. Uh, the best ones that you can get will be the cut resistant gloves because we dig around in the ground and there is always, especially going for relics and coins, in old areas, there'll be broken glass. And the last thing you want to do is actually stick your hand in and swipe away the stuff and slice the tip off your finger or whatever other part of your body. So a good pair of cut resistant gloves are always a good thing to have in your kit. Now, we are in summer and it was only a couple of days ago that I saw my first brown snake. Snake armor or snake gaiters or gaiters or whatever you'd like to call them. These have Kevlar in them, so strips of Kevlar. I suggest strongly that you get yourself a set of these. They go on quite nicely, onto the leg, around. You strap those around behind the leg there so you've got full protection. And then of course you would do the clips up and they're fairly comfortable to wear. Uh, I have seen some around that don't have the protective paneling on the back. Again, uh, these are from Mine Lab. Uh, sorry, from Miner's Den here, and they are an absolute brilliant pair of, of uh, gaiters. I bought a pair for my son for Christmas. He loves them, but especially in summer, well, in fact, when I start seeing the skinks come out around home, these start going onto my legs. Very, very worthwhile investment. The last two things that we should take out with us all the time, all the time, is some water, whatever container you want to have it in. This one's a stainless steel one. You can wash it out, you reuse it. Make sure you have water. You must keep hydrated out there. Um, a thing that you could do too is if it's really hot, but you still want to detect, chase the shade as well, but make sure you have your water. And the last thing that you really should take with you all the time is your phone. If you're in trouble, you can call someone, call a friend, could get you out. Sometimes it's just handy if you go, hmm, I think I'm here, check your Google Maps or your Google Earth. But don't leave home, it's like an American Express card, don't leave home without it. It could very well be the difference between you surviving or not surviving an accident out in the bush.
So that is a brief overview of safety gear that you should potentially take out into the bush with you. They're just small things, and as you can see, that doesn't actually take up a great deal of room on your body. This is the basic, you could take more, I certainly wouldn't take less. So, I'm the Coffee Bush Kid, and that's been a top tip for the Mind Lab Show. Okay, well that was a, another great uh, tip there from the Coffee Bush Kid, and it's great to have him contributing. Lots and lots of good information on coins and relics, and just keeping yourself safe when you're out in the bush. This week uh, we're now going to have a look at our fantastic store offer, which is again going to feature some of our bundles. So uh, we've got a very popular MineLab Equinox 800. Uh, it's a metal detector, an all-round, uh, excellent all-round detector for the serious detectorists. It's got eight custom search profiles built around park, field, beach, and gold modes. It comes with true, and that means true simultaneous multi-frequency technology for maximum performance and includes ultra-fast wireless audio with low latency Bluetooth headphones. Okay, it's also waterproof down to an impressive three meters for finding treasure in the beaches, rivers, creeks, or lakes. So this week what I've done is I've bundled up the Equinox 800 with a plastic sand scoop, a green trash or treasure bag, a mine lab cap, a handy jeweler's loop just to examine any of your uh, details on some of your finds. As well, we're throwing in the Tiger Cub digging tool. So we're selling the Equinox 800 bundle for 1150 So that's only, I guess, about $60, $50 more than what you buy for the standard machine. And you're getting over $360 worth of uh, goodies that are coming uh, all in the recommended retail price. I think the recommended retail price on that whole bundle would work out at somewhere around about $1,515. So uh, you can just get the standard machine, save yourself 50 bucks with a bundle like this that's absolutely jam-packed with value there um, so jump onto those it uh, offers only available for a limited time uh, and of course you can always grab one at minersden.com.au or at any of the Miners Den Mine Lab metal detector super stores so that covers off on our product spotlight for this evening uh, and it gets now time to ask Dave so this week I've got a couple of viewer questions that are uh, coming up here. The first one is uh, a question from Damien. And Damien says, Hi, I'm wondering about the Equinox 800 display. Sometimes when out detecting and it's hot and the sun is attacking the display screen, it turns all blurry and can't make up numbers, etc. Does the sun have a long-term effect on the display? Or could uh, a malfunction as if it had long-term exposure to the sun? Look, hi, Damien. It's a, a great question. Um, and thank you for putting that in. It's, uh, I had to reach out again to the, the MindLab uh, uh, team over in Adelaide there to try and come up with an answer for this one for you. So what they came back with was that the LCD glass will become blurry above temperatures of 60 degrees uh, Celsius and will return back to normal as the temperature starts to drop back below that amount. They could also confirm that there's no long-term effects from this transition or having it uh, as it transmitting between when it gets too warm and uh, gets blurry and heading back to normal. So. Uh, that was the information straight from uh, the horse's mouth, or my lab HQ. I hope that's uh, cleared up that one. Won't do any long-term damage to your machine there, and it does uh, come back uh, or transition back to a normal-looking screen once the temperature comes down. Now, of course, the second question uh, is from Sue this week, and it's another question about our Equinox. 800. So Sue's question is about uh, uh, the skid plate. Uh, Sue does most of the detecting on the beach, including where there's black sand, and both dry and in the water with the Equinox 800. It seems to work fine. Uh, she hoses it down uh, after each use with fresh water, but never actually takes the skid plate off, um, and always thought she would probably only do that if it was malfunctioning. There's, since there's nothing in the manual about uh, removing the skid plate uh, for general maintenance. 
However, she notices some people who are regularly taking it off to clean underneath. Um, as my lab didn't say anything in the menu about in the menu about re, about recommending or taking this off in the manual, um, I was wondering if there's a risk of weakening the skid plate uh, by popping it on and off uh, each time. Look, that's another great question, Sue. Um, thank you. The skid plate is designed to be removed for cleaning. I'll usually remove and clean under my skid plate when I've been out detecting in the wet or uh, about once a month. And probably if I was in a situation where I'm in and out of the water or salt water all the time with the Equinox and uh, with the black sand and things there, um, I would probably start to look at it uh, uh, doing it a, a little more regularly. Um, you can get black sand and moisture between the uh, coil and the skid plate um, and that may uh, mean that you'll get uh, the machine to become a little unstable. Look, I've got an Equinox 800 here with me, so I'm just going to show you quickly uh, with this one how I uh, pull off this skid plate. So it's just a matter of the skid plates on there and I just gently pull around the edge. This can be a little difficult sometimes, but I'll just keep working around the edge with it as I'm doing that. And the skid plates come off. Now, you can see here this one's been off. I've got a little cloth here as well, so I'll usually just uh, wipe over with a damp cloth. So I won't use any solvents or anything like that on the actual uh, coil or on the skid plate there. Just a damp cloth, wipe that over there. Then I'll also do the same on the inside of my skid plate. So just wipe through there with the cloth, take out any dirt or any uh, build up that might have been in there. Uh, as I said, it doesn't happen all the time, but you can end up with it so that it is giving you some false signals off if you have too much dirt and moisture between the skid plate. Okay, just leave that one there. We'll just whip this over, dry them off a little bit there. And a simple thing after that is just to whack the skid plate back on. It's just a simple matter of pressing it back on, so it's quite easy to do. Push that on there, make sure it's nice and tight. Once you've done that, that's done all the maintenance that you really need. Now, part of the, with the skid plate, unfortunately sometimes if you're a little bit uh, uh, eager with it when you're taking it off or if it's a bit worn, you will find that uh, you can sometimes uh, uh, get a little tear, a little damage in the skid plate on the edge. Um, if that happens, I've often put tape over if I've done something like that to, when I'm taking a skid plate off um, and that'll usually help get you the normal life out of your skid plate. Um, if unfortunately it does happen to you and you do tear a, a decent piece out of it because uh, it, it broke off when you were bringing it off, it may mean that your skid plate was nearly out of its uh, useful life and you can certainly uh, head into a Miner's Den store online and purchase another one. They're under $30, so that'll get you out of trouble as well. Thank you again for your question there, so I hope that helps you a little more. Uh, I certainly do clean under my skid plates to get my machines running a little more stable. Now look, don't forget, if you have a question about a MindLab product or how to use it, then pop it into the feed or onto our regular Saturday morning post and I'll have a crack at answering it live for you. I usually fit a couple of questions in during each show. So that's it for us, Dave, for tonight. Next coming up, we have a look at some of the finds from our customers who've entered Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt Facebook competition. Now, the February Pay Dirt competition is now open, and there are a few of the entries. We, here are a few of the entries that we've uh, got in so far. Chris has panned off his second 4.5 kilo tub of Gourmet Pay Dirt, and as you can see, he's found just over 9 grams of the yellow stuff for his efforts. Following up with that, we have Ben, who has scored just over half a gram from his 700 gram tag of Gold Digger Dave's Gourmet Pay Dirt. And of course, last but not least, we also have another entry here, and we look at Neil, who's panned this very impressive amount of gold from his 950 Gold Digger Days Gourmet Pay Dirt Bag. Now, of course, our monthly pay dirt uh, competition is very easy to enter. All you have to do is grab yourself a bag, a tub, or even a new one of the new buckets of Gold Digger Days Gourmet Pay Dirt, pan it off, and have a ball doing it. Uh, you'll hone your skills, get what you've got, your gold, your tokens, anything you've found in your uh, pay dirt, and uh, make sure you take a photo of that and share it to our pinned post on the Miners Den Australia 
Facebook page. All done. I'll announce one winner at the end of each month who will win a $50 Miner's Den gift voucher. And I really can't wait to see the photos of the gold that's going to come in from happy customers who grab themselves one of our one ounce Gold Digger Dave's pay dirt buckets. So that's uh, our pay dirt uh, competition. Keep putting your entries in. We'll have a look at a few more next week. And now we'll go and have a look at our gold hotspot and we take a look at the picturesque Gulgong in New South Wales. Let's have a look now. The town of Gulgong is located about 300 kilometres northwest of Sydney in the central tablelands of New South Wales. It's a popular tourist destination due to the well-preserved 19th century architecture giving visitors a sense of how the town would have appeared in its golden heyday. Early finds of gold in the area were minimal until April 1870 when Tom Saunders discovered a rich lode on Red Hill, setting off a gold rush that would quickly grow to a population of 20,000 within a couple of years of the find. Between 1870 and 1880, approximately 15 tonnes of gold was extracted from the Gorgon goldfields. The Happy Valley lead was particularly rich, where according to Doug Stone, one pan full of wash produced an astonishing 35 ounces of gold. Gorgong was one of the last gold fields to be described as a poor man's diggings. That is, diggers and their families with little capital were able to have a crack at making their fortune by digging for gold in the area. It's interesting to note that the famous author and poet Henry Lawson lived on the Gorgong goldfields as a child as his father brought his family to live in the gold town in the hope of making his family's fortune. The Gorgong gold boom was soon over as quickly as it began and by 1881 the population had shrunk to Okay, look, it looks like we had a bit of trouble here with um, our Facebook feed. So look, guys, if you want to jump over onto the YouTube channel. Look, I was talking about the uh, coin and treasure discoveries that I had up here at the moment. So the two highly decorated uh, Viking brooches have been found by a metal detectorist on the Isle of Man in the UK and have now been fully revealed to the public following a specialist conservation process. The highly decorated brooches are believed to be from around AD 900 to 950, AD 950, and were commonly worn by women in the Viking Age era. Uh, well, Viking Age Scandinavian era. Uh, there were a theory that only Viking men had settled on the Isle of Wight up until now, as the relics found among old burial sites there had typically been associated with men. The finding of the oval brooches on the island, which was seen as traditional Scandinavian female dress, has caused the experts to rethink who lived there during the Viking Age. Uh, another amazing find by metal detectors among the ancient sites 
of the UK. Now look, we still haven't been able to bring back up our uh, Facebook stream at the moment. Uh, so we're gonna finish out tonight just here on the YouTube channel. And of course, we'll put the winners of our viewer giveaway, which I've got here in shortly. So on Facebook, congratulations to Andrew C. Andrew, you've uh, won the prize for Facebook tonight. Just get in contact with um, Corey on the feed. Uh, just send him a DM with your details and we'll get that out to you. And on YouTube, Patrick H. Patrick H, congratulations. You've got the prize from uh, tonight for our YouTube watchers. So uh, we do know that Facebook has unfortunately gone down. I think we'll put something up in the, the feed if we could, but um, uh, we're going to have a look at that and see if we can't sort out what the problem was for next Next week's show. Now, of course, next week's show, we've announced the winners of the giveaway. It's time for a sneak peek on what's coming up on the next episode of the Mind Lab show. So, of course, we have coming up our fantastic viewer giveaway as per usual. And we're also going to check out the latest gold and treasure news. We'll catch up with Rhonda again in Gals on the Goldfield. There's another top tip coming your way and much, much more. I'm Gold Digger Dave from Miner's Den and thanks for watching the Mine Lab Show. We'll see you all next week. Thanks for watching. Remember, like, subscribe and share. Tune in next week for another episode of the Mine Lab Show.